Prepping yourself to look fine in ancient Rome isn't as different to now as you might think. Beauty back then was as relevant as it is now. But what was deemed attractive back then? And would you have been a beauty? Would any of us? So while I'm getting ready, let's talk about how the Romans would do it. Among the things that mattered to Romans were blusher, eyeliner, perfume and face masks. Face masks were big maybe even bigger than they are now. But you wouldn't find a charcoal and collagen mask in Rome BC. Instead, crocodile dung was all the rage, if you could afford it. And the commonly held belief was that it could permanently lighten your skin. And the use of crocodile dung didn't originate in Rome. Apparently, the ancient Egyptians were using crocodile dung in their mud baths way before the Romans cottoned onto the trend. Let's start with the base, the complexion. Romans used base makeup like how we use foundation, but theirs had ingredients like chalk powder and white lead. White lead was effective and widely used, but it also caused lead poisoning, which led to hair loss, infertility, damage to your central nervous system and organs, and ironically, skin damage. It's actually lead carbonate, a compound and complex salt containing carbonate and hydroxide ions. You see, lead is absorbed into the body over time and stored in our blood, bones, tissue and teeth. Our bodies absorb it like it's calcium, although lead has none of the same benefits. In fact, a high concentration of lead in our bodies can lead to lead poisoning, which affects the brain and nervous system by breaking down the communications between nerve cells, muscles and hormones that calcium usually performs. So I think we'll put the lead to bed. I'll stick with setting powder for now. So you've got your base done, now it's time to get those rosy cheeks. Blushes in ancient Rome were popular and there was a wide selection available. But this wasn't like choosing between cream and powder, you had to use wildly different substances. What you used to redden your cheeks was based on what you could afford and oddly, the more pricey your selection, the more likely it was to poison you. Wealthy Roman women applied either vermilion red to their cheeks, a pigment made by breaking down the mineral cinnabar, or they used red lead. Cinnabar is a mineral comprised of toxic mercury sulfide and red lead is also known as lead oxide. Both of these are poisonous substances and they were known to be at the time, but they stayed on trend because they were rare, effective and exotic. If you were a bit low on money, you had other options. The non-toxic red ochre was a possibility. If you were really strapped for cash, however, you could always use the dregs of your wine mixed with mulberries. I might have to remember that one. In The Art of Beauty, written between 1 BC and 8 AD, the poet Ovid wrote, I have seen a woman pound up poppies soaked in cold water and rub her cheeks with them. So it's all starting to come together. We've got our foundation and we've done our cheeks. So what's next? It's time to frame the windows to the soul. Eyeliner was a sign of beauty adopted from ancient Egypt. The substance widely used was called coal, which is a substance made by breaking down coal stone, also known as galena. G galena? Ga ga galena? While this was another lead-based compound, a coal liner like this one is still used today. In ancient Egypt, Cleopatra and even her servants were wearing eyeliner, even the men. Now for the hair. Fashionable hairstyles changed often. Having a complicated hairstyle was popular for the same reason as having pale skin. It demonstrated that you had enough time to do your hair. Coveted styles usually involved a mix of braids, knots and ringlets and were held up using ornate pins comprising jewels, gold and ivory. Wealthy Roman women even had their own personal hairdresser, but she was a slave called an ornatrix. Hair dyeing was as common as it is today. After the conquest of Gaul, a country that comprised France, Luxembourg, Belgium and parts of Germany, blonde hair became popular. Before that, darker hair was desired. For darker dyes, the combination included boiled walnuts, charred eggs, leeks and leeches. This was left to ferment. Fermented leech juice was nothing compared to what you had to do to dye your hair blonde. For that, your hair was covered in pigeon poo or doused in urine. The ammonia acted as a bleach, which made the whole process practical as well as thoroughly disgusting. As ever, there was an alternative option for the rich. 
If you were wealthy enough, you could literally sprinkle gold into your hair. Talk about flashing the cash. Henna, a natural dye that is still used today, was also an option open to you for darker hues as a citizen of ancient Rome. It works by penetrating your hair's cuticles and into the cortex layer, where the hair's colour is formed. Since it lasts for a long time, this would be the ideal choice for any citizen concerned about hair care. Men were also concerned about their hair, especially if they were losing it. A full head of hair was linked to vitality. In his play, The Twelve Caesars, a historian described the Emperor Domitian as having the disfigurement of baldness. However, there was one group in ancient Rome who managed to sidestep this bald shaming, become a philosopher, and baldness is no longer a sign of lost vitality, but a clear indicator that you have a lot to say and you have dedicated yourself to Rome. So you've got the look, but have you got the smell? Perfume was definitely a part of Roman life. In fact, the term was coined by them. Perfumum, which means through smoke, used in worship at temples and at home, having a good odour was linked to having good health. Archaeological evidence supports that it was used throughout the Roman Empire and used a wide array of ingredients, including rose water, saffron and lilies. There were even celebrity brands, with the sweat of famous gladiators being scraped off the skin and sold outside arenas. So if you wanted to be considered a beauty in ancient Rome, you'd better be prepared to set aside the time. You'd need to have a pale, unblemished face, which was achieved by layering on creams that would poison you. You'd also need to have rosy cheeks by using a blusher that would also poison you. And in a shocking twist, eyeliner, which could also poison you. Your hair will not only need to be the latest style, but also whatever shade is on trend. And well, if that poisons you, something's gone very wrong. Most importantly, you need to put in a lot of work to make it look like you've done barely anything at all. Sound familiar? Strictly defined, the definition of what's considered beautiful still lingers. It has simply morphed into a different list of desired traits. But as the definition so nearly goes, Rome and better definitions of beauty were not built in a day.